cancer victims and their families. We are a network of local, regional, and international civil society organizations working collectively towards justice and accountability in Asia. Um, to start with, let's just go over some of the housekeeping rules for today's panel. Um, we will first hear opening remarks from each of our panels, panelists, and then we will have moderated uh, discussion with them. After that, we will be opening up the session to question and answers from you, the audience. If you have a question, please ask in the question and answer box, not in the chat box, and you will find this at the bottom of your screen. Please ask questions at any time. We will be monitoring them. And if your question is for a particular panelist, please feel free to indicate that. I will just frame uh, the discussion in brief, just a few points. And we will then, of course, go to our panelists who I know you're all waiting to hear from. I think there are a number of events that have taken place in the last year and a half. And you know, I, I'm sure many of you have also followed the webinar that has taken place on Tuesday, where we've been talking about the International Court of Justice and the, the proceedings at the ICJ. I would like to take one step back and frame it in reference to what is happening currently in Myanmar, what is the impact of the coup, what are the implications of this for Myanmar as a whole, and for the Rohingya community specifically. Again, looking at legal proceedings, these are numerous. We have the International Criminal Court, the International Court of Justice proceedings currently, a universal jurisdiction case. You've got the uh, mechanism for Myanmar. What are the interconnections and how do they relate to the Rohingya community in particular is something that we need to focus on and, and look at in greater detail. And as a last sort of dot point, it would be what next? What are the hopes, fears, expectations from the international community at large, the UN civil society, and what needs to be done in terms of the future path for the Rohingya? With that as sort of a guiding frame of reference, it is really my pleasure to introduce you to a stellar panel of activists and advocates, and we are really privileged to have them with us today all together on this panel, and I'm sure we're gonna have a fantastic discussion. So I will just briefly go over some of the incredible biographies of our panelists, and then we'll go straight into um, our discussion session. I'd start with Wei Wenu. She is a former political prisoner and the founder and executive director of Women Peace Network in Myanmar. Wei Wei spent seven years as a political prisoner in Burma because of her father's pro-democracy political activism. Since her release from prison in 2012, she has dedicated herself to working for democracy and human rights, particularly on behalf of marginalized women and members of her own ethnic group, the Rohingya. Tunkin is an ethnic Rohingya Muslim from Arakan, Rakhine State in Myanmar, and the president of the Burmese Rohingya Organization UK, Brook, and a prominent activist for the Rohingya people. Tunkin has spearheaded the universal jurisdiction case in Argentina against the military junta. Tunkin's tireless advocacy for the Rohingya cause has taken him around the globe several times over. He has spoken about the genocide facing the Rohingya before the US Congress, European Parliament, European Human Rights Council, the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, and other UN bodies. We next have the pleasure of having Yasmin Ola on this panel, who is a Rohingya social justice activist born in the Northern Rakhine state of Myanmar. She fled to Thailand in 1995, along with her parents, and remained a refugee in Thailand until 2011. She's currently serving as a board member of ALTSEAN, steering committee of the Bridges MM project, which helps train and connect young people across Myanmar. She has worked on various projects such as Time to Act, Rohingya Voices exhibition with the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, the Genocide Learning Tool with the Montreal Holocaust Museum, and the anthology, I Am a Rohingya, where she published her poetry along with other Rohingya poets from around the world. In 2021, she was named on the Family List 100, the gender security project list of 100 women from the global south, working in foreign policy, peace building, law, activism, and development. Next up on our panel, we have Rai Stin Mong, who is the founder and board chair of the Rohingya Human Rights Network, a volunteer-run Rohingya advocacy network in Canada, and Rohingya Empowerment Projects, a grassroots-run portfolio of schools and vocational training programs at the Rohingya refugee camps and villages. He is originally from the township of Akya, Burma, and currently lives in Ottawa, Canada. 
And last, but certainly not the least, we have Nesan Nguyen, who is a Rohingya activist and blogger. He is both co-founder and coordinator for campaign and media relations of Free Rohingya Coalition. For the past 18 years, since his departure from Myanmar, he has been documenting human rights violations and military campaigns of the Takmador in the Arakan state of Myanmar. He's a prolific commentator on Rohingya issues on radio, television channels, and other mainstream media outlets. He views his prime role as a passionate campaigner, providing an up-to-date information service, verification, fact-checking, including situation updates and analyses. With this introduction to this fabulous panel, we will now go to opening remarks from each of our panelists. And if I could start with um, Yasmin to kick off the proceedings and the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm not going to spend too much um, of the opening remarks, um, but I want to highlight um, two key things that uh, I think is important for us to discuss. Um, and thank you for, you know, for having me, first of all. Um, it's such an honor to join you all today. Um, I want to mention that the, the international processes, um, especially this one, uh, with uh, with the world's courts involved or, you know, any other accountability mechanism um, at the international level, none of it are going to be a magic potion for us. It is not going to solve the problem that Rohingya are uh, faced with, um, not in Rakhine State, not in Bangladesh, not, you know, in the entirety of the region um, across Asia. There is um, a huge uh you know, a huge momentous um, uh, leverage though from these processes that, that, that we could actually, you know, use in order to further um, our developments and, and progress as a community. I hope and, and pray that throughout all of these different processes um, by international actors, the, the importance of rebuilding our community will be placed you know, as a priority number one, there should not be just vindication or um, catharsisism from holding Myanmar military or, you know, non-military um, actors accountable. It should focus and, you know, really, really focus on the victims and their, you know, survivability on, on their, um, on their ability to live life in dignity, in peace. That is, uh, I think, should be the priority number one. It is amazing to see Myanmar military, you know, stumble and, and, and fumble and, and not being able to answer different questions from the international actors. But it's as important, if not more, for us to actually focus our efforts and, and utmost, you know, uh, 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 help um, and uh, assistance towards the victims um, and the people who are currently uh, going through continuous, uh, you know, prosecution in Rakhine State. Um, with, um, uh, with this, I want to also mention that the, the, the genocide has not yet ceased. Um, the military did not stop in 2017. There is still ongoing efforts to actually discriminate against Rohingya and exclude us from various different uh, political participation. At the same time, there have been many Rohingya just within this last few months. Um, and this is citing the work um, of Weiwei's organization, the Women Peace Network, um, because they have reported that there have been uh, many Rohingya who've been arrested um, just because of their movement. And the mobility rights is one of the things that was stripped away um, as part of the larger plan to prosecute and annihilate Rohingya. So this is an important thing that I, I think the international community should not forget. Rohingya are continuously going through this. There, there should not, you know, there, there, you, you need to keep your eyes on the Rohingya. I know there are a lot of issues that are ongoing within Myanmar, but Rohingya needs to continue to be priority because without, you know, making Rohingya issue a priority, there cannot be a long lasting solution or a sustainable one um, towards any other problem of impunity within the country. It started with Rohingya 
and without ending it at, you know, at the level that Rohingya are suffering through, we're not going to be able to decipher what needs to be done um, to resolve the issues for everyone. The other thing that I think is important for, um, for my questions later and for our discussions perhaps later um, is that I know there is a, a discussion and a lot of um, uh, uh, a lot of dissatisfaction with the military being the representative of the state of Myanmar currently. I know it is not ideal. I don't like it either. But looking at it from the point of view of the victims, we have not heard once what the military thought in a legal court. They have always acted through proxy. And in this case, it is almost cathartic for victims to actually be able to hear their perpetrator um, or their, you know, the, their, their legal counsel speak on behalf of the military and for any further potential accountability or mechanisms that will follow in the future, which I hope there will be um, with our consolidated efforts and, and continuous approach, um, continuous um, pressure on this, the representation as it stands may be helpful since it's not uh, it's not going to be treated as proxy actions and i will end it there thank you very much for your attention thank you very much jasmine for your remarks i think i'll turn to wei wei now thank you very much priya it's an honor to join you all today um, I will also be quite uh, quick and I will leave the time for a QA and a more uh, to have a, uh, I guess, more engaging discussion. Um, so despite the ongoing um, ICJ's hearing and nationwide pro-democracy movement, um, the Myanmar military attempt, attempted coup last year has exacerbated the situations of uh, the situations for all Rohingya as a group. Um, we must remember that uh, the junta is composed of the same forces that launched the genocidal attack against our community in 2017 and are continue to practice genocidal policies and segregation as we speak. Um, like decades before, the Myanmar military is uh, systematically persecuting Rohingya remaining in Myanmar, including by uh, confining over 50, 150,000 people in Rakhine state and penalizing Rohingya movement as Yasmin uh, mentions and imposing many other forms of uh, repressions, including uh, sweat and sit family, the very humiliated family check-in processes and um, targeting us with hate speeches and other form of uh, racist propaganda, once again. Um, the root of the military systematic persecutions of our group is what has been bravely communicated by the Gambia over these years. Um, the military wants uh, to murder us, deliberate us with, de debilitate us with mental and physical harms and destroy us completely. Today, Honta is again, whitewashings of its murderous age agenda to the highest court of the world is further evidence that these uh, perpetrators of genocide will never be agents of peace. And being reminded of this, Rohingya in Bangladesh and across the world are losing hope about our common future and prospect of repatriation. We fear that we may be left to face squalid camps restri in a restricted livelihood and increasing uh, securitizations, hate narrative, and again, with prospect of no returning to our home and to rebuild our life as a community. And through the hearings, uh, and though the, the hearings give us um, a hope for justice, we worry that the world may continue to see us as nothing more than just victims of genocide. But this applies to Myanmar as well, though it has been some progress for justice and accountability over the past year. The key change that the attempted coup has brought is 
more discussions about the Rohingya's coexistence in federal democracy in the country's future. It is also because more and more Myanmar people are recognizing um, the generational suffering of ethnic minorities and leaders of the pro-democracy movement, including NUG, um, are expressing a stronger commitment to following international standards than previous government. Um, however, one year, uh, over a year since the attempted coup, Rohingya remain excluded as agents and key stakeholders in this potentially transformative movement of our country. Leaders and policymakers have yet to invite our community as participants or uh, in debates related to our future or um, uh, have dialogue to come up with a potential uh, agreement for our futures um, to secure in our futures in Myanmar, our future in Myanmar. In Myanmar and abroad, certain experts and organizations are raising concerns about the country's representations before the ICJ without even consulting us and asking us what justice truly means for us and what does all these processes mean. Like during the so-called democratic transitions in the past, Rohingya are being sidelined um, in, dis in discussions related to our own future and our country. Instead, we continue to be tokenized for one's political advantage and um, our ex um, expert insights are dismissed um, as if our perspective can only be those of victims and never, and, 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 and never survivors. What the attempted coup has brought about now more than ever is the need for Rohingya to be included as stakeholders seen as seriously in, our, in Myanmar's future. As the people of Myanmar progress towards a truly democratic, uh, inclusive democracy, it is important that all actors meaningfully engage with our community in any relevant discussions. United by a common enemy, which is the junta, we must also remember that what connect the issue related to Myanmar and Rohingya is the military's decades long impunity. As the ICJ hearing worked to end this, most likely in years time, the UN member states and UN Security Council must take concerted and coordinated actions against the junta immediately by adopting the resolu resolutions that include targeted economic sanctions, financial penalties, arms embargo, global, a global arms embargo, and referral to the International Criminal Court. What is happening, uh, uh, um, the situations of Rohingya and what is happening against our people in Myanmar and Bangladesh today is the result of decades, uh, decades of such impunity, as well as um, the failure to act upon the voice of Rohingya. Amid the ICJ hearing, the nationwide pro-democracy movement, our voice must be heard and trusted. We are the experts of our genocide. The path forward for Rohingya can only be led by the Rohingya. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Weiwei. Uh, we'll now turn to Tunkin. Thank you, Priya. Thank you. Um, Global Justice Center organizing this event and glad to be here with my brothers and sisters uh, in a great panel today as we are talking about what is the path forward for the community. Uh, if I may point out a first thing is the justice for the Rohingya, this ICJ case is very important and I'm glad, we are, I'm glad to see that it is moving forward, no matter what there is presentation issues or those things we are hearing. But as a Rohingya, as I'm Rohingya, as a genocide survivor, we want justice. So for the justice, we do not want to get delay and justice delay, justice denied. And what we 
can see here, right, like my sisters are mentioned, you know, harassment, extortions, and uh, the existential threat to the Ro Rohingya in our country, state, denying our citizenship and denying our identity. And we can see that unbearable situation created by the Bami's military in the past government and the people are fleeing from the country, from Rakhine state, many by boat and they were sentenced to jail and sending them to the prison. And even, you know, very uh, teenagers are included there. And so long we are calling for international community for justice and for restoring our rights. And during the 2015-20s before the coup, we, we knock all the doors to restore the rights of our brothers and sisters and 600 Rohingya, 600,000 Rohingya people, they are the risks of genocide and genocide is ongoing there. We never know what happened anytime soon. And there are many ways we are facing, you know, not only, you know, uh, from the military, from other sides, we are also facing a lot of threats for our existence. And one million Rohingya in the camp, they are still, with a squalid condition. We appreciate Bangladesh government giving us a shelter. And unfortunately, 40% population are children. Unfortunately, they are not getting education. A growing population without education. Of course, we appreciate Bangladesh giving us a shelter. Same time, we want to see. We, can, we want to see that Bangladesh government support empower Rohingya community. I mean, adequating, I mean, uh, allowing us, of course, international community supporting for humanitarian aid, we really appreciate. And Bangladesh government, we want to appeal to allow Rohingya people capacity building. Education is the backbone of the community. Our young brothers and sisters, they are, they are not getting education and we don't know after 10 years what these children will be and their future will be, no one knows. And so same time international community, they are supporting justice and we can see targeting military sanctions and military aid cutting. These are a uh, welcoming step, but we have not seen except Canada and Netherlands, no country joining this case, even though we campaigning for so long. And we have not seen the countries, they are uh, supporting, you know, other justice issue, cases. I mean, when we look around here, these are all the recommendation UN fact-finding mission. United Nations fact-finding mission, mission mentioned that what's happening to the Rohingya is genocide and still not accepting the report, unfortunately, and not supporting what they should do. We can see, to be honest, lip service here, not practical action taken by governments. Of course, we appreciate their support, humanitarian aid for the people. Of course, Rohingya survival is important. But we are a people, we have our culture, we have our civilization, we have our land in our country. We have a native land. So we grown up with our income, with our properties we had. We are a people belongs to Burma and we have uh, our forefathers been participated building up Burma nation in constitutional issues and others. So we are not a people like without any uh, kind of floating people or something like that. We, we should, we don't want to treat it with that way to us, you know? So we belongs to Burma. We want to see international community, political solution to return back our native land with our rights and protection. 
And that is what I can see from international side and much more need to be done. Of course, international community focus is on coup, military coup has happened. Of course, we are together with the people of Burma together fighting to get rid of these military criminal guys who are, who, are, uh, who are killing the people of Burma every day. We are together with them. We have feeling when I can see our brothers and sisters in China State, Kashina State, Karen State, Karen State, and Tenterland houses were burned down. Our hearts and minds are with them. We can feel the same because we Rohingya suffered enough of this. We, we know how military uh, crimes against Rohingya people. At the same time, when a community facing genocide, this need to be also important to focus and including not only international community, our brothers and sisters from Burma, they have to take a note that in our country, a community, a population, Rohingya community facing genocide. So that is very important. And I just want to bring up also, we have a case in universal jurisdiction case, we file up in uh, Argentina. Of course, that is also UN fact finding mission given you know, recommendations call international community to support justice for the cases and revenues, whatever we have. And on that point, we took that a stand to, to do that. And our lawyer, Thomas Cantana, who is former special reporter on Burma, as you all know, we, we opened up in 2019, November, and it took like almost two years. And then we, we got a chance to get open an investigation last, November 29th and December 2nd week, I was able to visit there to give to when to Bono Saira testified and we, uh, the case is uh, moving forward and very happy that the, the case, they are investigating victims, uh, you know, from the camps who are, uh, we have filed up, we have, when we file also, we have six Rohingya women victims from the camp, they will testify and then more victims will be testifying. That is the next step when we are trying to get from Facebook, we are trying to get evidence and also IIWM International Investigative Mechanism for Myanmar is truly supporting in this case. We appreciate that they are cooperating. That is fantastic step. And when we talk about justice, we, uh, for the, Argentina case, whatever cases, we're not talking only for the Rohingya. For our brothers and sisters from Burma, we are together with them to get justice, not only for our community. All of our brothers and sisters from Burma, we are facing many decades of crimes by Burmese military. Of course, Rohingyas are genocide facing. So we are together, same boat, to fight to get rid of this military. And we hope that Rohingya are playing a key role frontline for the justice for the Rohingya and all the people of Burma. We fought for justice and we will continue to fight for it. And same time, we want to see from brothers and sisters from Burma, whenever we talk for justice, when Rohingyas are facing, we have to speak up. When Kashin brothers and sisters are facing any crimes by Burmese military, we have to stood up for the justice. Anywhere in Burma, Sagaina State, Mendeley, uh, Sagaina Division, Mendeley Division, or Shin State, Shin brothers and sisters, if they face, we have to stand up on the truth and justice, whoever face it, no matter where they belong to. So on that principle, I think we can move forward together to fight for justice for Rohingya and all the people of Burma. I stop here, sorry, I'm, I think I'm taking off. Thank you for that, Duncan. I think we'll turn now to Rone Sandrin for his uh, comments. Thank you, uh, Priya. Uh, thanks for organizing this important event and thanks for inviting me to join and this panel to discuss ongoing hearing at the International Court of Justice and the situation of the Rohingya. 
of course, the Rohingya and the pro-democracy movement in Myanmar didn't want the, the military regime to represent the state of Myanmar at the ICJ. However, the reality is that uh, the military regime has represented the state. And indeed, the agent of Myanmar, the representative of the military regime who opened their submission behaved like a military representative and he lied. He lied that they are working for the repatriation of the Rohingya in Bangladesh. This is not true at all. As far as I know, the, the Bangladesh government has sent a list of 800,000 refugees to be verified for repatriation. It was a long time ago. Uh, Myanmar has only verified uh, less than 5%. When the news uh, broke about the ICJ hearing, the region sent a delegation to Bangladesh to show the world that uh, they are in process of sorting out this uh, uh, repatriation. But uh, please do not be fooled. Uh, they have done nothing to prepare the ground in Myanmar in any way whatsoever. The agent also mentioned the closure of the internally displaced camp in Sitri and elsewhere. Rohingya have been confined in this internment camp for almost 10 years. In the last five years, to quote international public opinion, the uh, Myanmar region has been talking up the closure of these uh, IDP camps without any reason. The closure of the uh, IDP camp has, of course, uh, nothing to do with the internally displaced people being able to return to their original villages. No, oh, not at all. Uh, they will be placed somewhere completely and related to where they had their home and livelihood. In effect, it will be like uh, moving from one camp to another. And please also remember that both before and after the order of provisional measure by the ICJ, Myanmar deliberately carried out large scale destruction of evidence of their action in 2017. Belish were bulldozed. New structures were built in Rohingya villages. In some places, military have built their own bases. Some areas have been occupied by people who didn't live there originally. Although the court recognized the Rohingya as a protected group and ordered the, the region to ensure that no act of genocide were being carried out against the Rohingya, the reality is that dozens of Rohingya have been shot dead and kill in artillery attack after just week of the court order. It is clear that Myanmar want to be seen as complying, but in reality doesn't want to comply with the court order. For example, uh, let us consider the freedom of movement. Uh, strict restriction were uh, again imposed last year. Rohingya have been suffering from this restriction for 30 years. People can move even if they have acquired permission from the Belish authority, they need to accept their national verification card. This card designates Rohingya as foreigner. This is why we call it the genocide card. It denies our history and our existence. This restriction affects livelihood, business, healthcare access, and personal interaction. There are also numerous reports of violence abuse of women and the elderly when they try to tra travel from one village to another, even when they do so with permission from the local authority, but without an NVC card. The Rakhine state is an open air prison held for the Rohingya. Their slow response uh, of the wall make it even more intolerable. There is too little action and what there is, is insufficient. The people who have the might of arms are abusing innocent people. People can abide by the suffering and fall prey to human trafficker. The Rohingya genocide survivor in the Bangladeshi camp and the Rakhine state are being of for extremely dangerous journeys to Malaysia. People want to escape, so they put together a considerable amount of money to secure their escape only often to meet a worse fate. And if by chance they are caught by the Myanmar forces, they can be sentenced to up to two years in prison with hard labor. In conclusion, Rohingya and Rakhine state are not protected. 
both stake actors and non-stake actors are persecuting the Rohingya. In short, genocide is ongoing and this will not stop unless the perpetrator are brought to justice. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think we'll have our last comments for this section from Rice. Justice Coalition, the uh, No Peace Without Justice uh, Center for our responsibility to protect everybody else. All the viewers as well who are looking uh, have, have taken the time. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us in solidarity. Uh, it's a historic week for us, for the Rohingya people. And uh, it's also a week of resurrection of uh, fresh wounds that have not healed. Uh, it hasn't been very long since the last massacres took place. And to add to this absurdity, uh, to add to all this is the absurdity of, uh, of the defense and the arguments that they're making. I'm sure you're all aware about uh, you know, the arguments such as the state, it was this, uh, the, the, the council that talked about the state not required, is that the state is not required to protect uh, non-citizens. Um, I, I don't know what he was thinking. Uh, is he not aware of, uh, of, of the ergonomics or uh, uh I'm sure he's aware, but but they're making these arguments uh, just to reenact those wounds again. Um, and of course, about Gambia being a proxy behind the OIC. Um, and ironically, uh, interestingly, you see the, the fact of the matter is that the court might very well dismiss the case on grounds of these objections, or even worse, you know, it may decide to go, uh, it does not have jurisdiction uh, on grounds because uh, it is not, genocide was not the only intent, for example, for what we saw in the case of Bosnia and uh, in the case of, uh, uh, of Croatia. Uh, you see, that could very well happen. So that's, that's the reminder for us uh, for not putting ICJ uh, or ICC or the universal ju jurisdiction or any kind of, uh, you know, mechanism that's out there on a pedestal that it's the be and all. No, it is not. Uh, you know, it does not. Nothing negates the fact of what took place to us, uh, that genocide did take place. We don't need a court in Europe uh, to explain that to us. However, having said that, it does not take away from the fact that uh, these justice mechanisms uh, or, or any of, of the activities um, that bring to, to attention the issue of the Rohingya um, is unprecedented for us. It's, we haven't had so much attention uh, given in the previous years. And, and it's thanks to, to, these, uh, uh, to, to these legal mechanisms that are out there and a lot of uh, good effort put by activists, uh, including uh, you know, all of my colleagues here who are on, on, this, uh, uh, on this event. So, uh, and it's very important for, for the world where we live in today, where we've got one event after the another, uh, unfolding before our eyes. You know, we don't have scarcity of them starting from, you know, what's happening in Xinjiang to what's happening in uh, in Bengaluru, for example, where you are pre at the moment, uh, or what's happening in Sheikh Jarrah, or even to, 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 to take Ukraine for today, uh, you know, in Luhansk and Donetsk. So having said all that, what does it mean for my people who are living the brunt of this on the grounds? Um, for them, unfortunately, my people, the vast majority of them, they, are, they do not even know how to read and write. Uh, and for them, uh, what's important is where they live today, you know, where they go to school, what are they going to eat? A good number of them in Myanmar even struggle to have one meal a day, you see. So whether they're going to get you know, human trafficked or not. So if, I would say, in my opinion, if these legal mechanisms or any of the initiatives that are out there do not successfully uh, or do not translate into uh, taking away uh, or into relieving the, the pains that my people are living on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, for example, my, for, for my, uh, the schools that we run in the refugee camps, their concern is whether we'll go to school tomorrow or not, whether it's gonna get shut down tomorrow or not, just like Tunkin was referring to. You know, uh, if these are not going to get translated into meaningful actions on the grounds, 
where they will see their lives change uh, for for real. Until then, I would say uh, we we are not able to measure uh, properly how much success we have attained. Uh, that should be our measure of success moving forward. Thank you very much for that, Rice. I think we've had uh, a lot of strands in the discussion from all of y'all on you know, the humanitarian um, goals, the reference to ongoing atrocities and genocide. We've talked about the ICJ and the representation issues and the lack of involvement or lack of um, sort of checking in with the Rohingya community as well on that. I think we've got multiple strands now that we can talk about and, and open up for a bit more discussion. What I would uh, like to sort of just remind viewers is if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A, not in the, the other chat box. I can see there are a few questions. Um, I will now briefly ask a few questions following up from the, the opening remarks that we've had. And let's then keep the forum open for the Q&A from the audience. So I think we'll go in the same order if that's okay for all our panelists and give the ladies the floor first. So Yasmin coming back to you now, I think just pulling up um, you know, some of what you've said where you really talked about the international um, mechanisms not being, and to quote you, not being a magic portion. And, and I think that's a, a very sort of real sort of check as well on the way we're, we're viewing these uh, proceedings. So I think if you could speak a little bit more to that as well as perhaps the um, role and actions of the NUG linked to these international justice processes, I think that would be of great interest. Thank you for the question. Um, with regards to the NUG, um, there are certainly um, several elements to it, um, especially with the NUG's relationship with the Rohingya community. Um, I believe that there is a huge gap of unfulfilled uh, responsibility. If the national unity government is surely serious about taking up the responsibility to govern um, and to be the representative of the state, it actually has way more work to do. And one, um, especially because I have seen several ministers uh, made uh, arguments that they need to be representative of Myanmar as a state at the ICJ, and this is detrimental. Yes, I do agree. And I myself am supportive of the NUG. I do not support SAC. I do not support the current military regime. I do want to see the world in which Rohingya can actually safely go back home, rebuild our community at the support of the NUG and other um, you know, uh, national and, and domestic organizations, um, especially with the support of our ethnic counterparts, um, that would be an ideal uh, situation. However, right now, what the NUG can do, there are so many tangible steps that they can take. One is to uh, ensure a proper declaration of the genocide determination. So far, the NUG continuously uh, support this argument that this is a crimes against humanity. I don't think it is. Um, it is uh, under the NUG's purview to actually determine anything. Um, we should take from you know the, the existing literature from the UN and, uh, from the UN fact finding mission um, reports and from several other you know uh, uh, countries that have actually determined this to be a genocide. Um, the NUG will continue to lack the. Um, uh, the credibility that it needs in order to um, continue its work and assume power um, without a proper uh, solution laid out for the Rohingya. And one of that will have to come from within. Um, when we talk about accountability and impunity within Myanmar, we are not just talking about holding the Myanmar military accountable. We are talking about every single aspect, 
as minuscule as it is, every single aspect of governance, be it you know executive branch, legislative branch, or the judicial branch, all have to come into the microscopic view and hold themselves accountable. That is the only way we can get get out of this rust. Um, and and this this includes you know putting putting um, their money where their mouth is. It's it's not just it's not just um, the genocide determination, and that is going to end you know every single problems that we ever had. Um, the NUG still lack you know inclusion of Rohingya in all of their uh, in all of their efforts, um, not just not just in the advisory role, which is very tokenized, um, in my opinion, and I may come off as very, very controversial at the moment, but you have to understand I'm coming from a place where I want to see the NUG does better. I want them to do better. I want them to actually take this very seriously because unless the Rohingya issue ends, unless the Rohingya per pros uh, persecution end, no other uh, persecution will ever end impunity problems will never go away. And this emphasized the, the, the understanding or, or the importance of non-military actors being held accountable. And this is where the NUG has been unfortunately inefficient. Um, when Rohingya are being used just as a tool to further gain international recognition, it is not enough um, for, for them to parade around and say, we have called them Rohingya. That's the bare minimum. That is the bare minimum you can do. Um, it, discriminated, discriminatory policies have not been unturned, have, have not been overturned, um, sorry. And so many other historical racist and bigoted um, claims that many of the people who are involved in the CRPH, in the NUCC and in the NUG, have not been dealt with. And how are we going to have confidence in a group of people, in a, um, in a governing system that we're trying to get behind um, when they're not trying to hold themselves accountable to the, full ex uh, to the fullest extent? So this would include, and I'm going to, again, warn you that I'm being very controversial, the NUG ministerial um, uh, roles should be kept for people who can actually do the job without being racist. And this is talking to various different ministry um, who, you know, currently the ministers are um, not actually um, holding themselves accountable. And many of them have not been, uh, uh, have, have been silent at the very least on the Rohingya issue or what their past actions have been. Um, many of those ministers have not actually come um, come out to, to apologize to Rohingya. And that's, again, very much a bare minimum. Um, this is very, very simplistic tasks that uh, the NUG can follow very quickly and very thoroughly. We cannot have a leadership that will end up hurting people or has, you know, lingering racism and bigotry. Um, in their mind, because how are we going to trust their policies? How are we going to trust that they will govern with our best interest in mind? And that is the question I'm going to, you know, uh, raise and, and, and stop here. I think the NUG has a lot of potential, but as I'm speaking to you now, and I hope someone from the NUG sees this, you need to include Rohingya in every single room, in every single uh, uh, meetings and every single uh, 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 table. We're not just here to be used as a tool for you to parade us around the world for you know, international recognition. We're here, we're not going anywhere. We are one of the citizens um, in your country. We deserve a place to live. We deserve ethnic status. We are an ethnic group and no one can say otherwise. We have that, um, uh, uh, you know, we have that right to return home and rebuild the community alongside with all of you. So please, please recognize, uh, recognize that this is an opportunity, a golden one that you can take to increase your own credibility and increase your own ability to actually do more good in this revolution. It is not a revolution if it doesn't include Rohingya. Thank you.
Thank you for that, for your impassioned um, statements, uh, Yasmin. I think what I'd like to pick up from that and you know, go to Weiwei, keeping in mind Weiwei, your initial comments as well, where what really struck me was when you said Rohingya are excluded as agents and not included in parts of the process. So drawing, I think also from what Yasmin has said, to try to link it to the ICJ hearings. And, you know, do you see this as an opportunity or a venue, given that this case is about the Rohingya genocide and it's under the Genocide Convention, and given its prominence and, and you know, worldwide sort of focus, do you see this case as a way of engaging and, and ensuring greater sort of representation and inclusion as agents for the Rohingya community as well? Um, sure. Um, so it was fantastic points made by Yasmin earlier. I'll just add, build on that. Um, yes, I do believe that the ICJ hearings um, opens door for accountability for Rohingya and broader serious human rights violations in Myanmar in general. At the same time, it opens doors for discussions in within Myanmar um, for the first time. I mean, I remember it was the fact-finding missions when people started to become aware of what is happening in Myanmar. Then we have several these judicial processes um, and the ICJ is the most prominent one that actually give us opportunity to open up more. So it has a lot of benefit to it. It has, um, we can really uh, be, uh, kind of like, you know, using it as a platform to really open up the discussions and to really push for a sustainable and and um, uh, and, and lasting um, uh, political solutions in Myanmar. So for, I think one thing that there are a lot of misconceptions between the uh, Rohingya and international community and and the uh, larger Burmese audience and Burmese uh, political leaders. The knowledge gap is so high. I think what we have to do is minimize that gap. And that gap, uh, can, we can minimize that gap by having more dialogue, more engagement with the, uh, with, the, with the Rohingya community. That's the first point I wanna make. And only then we'll be able to move forward. Right now, we're not on the same page. While international community are, are talking about citizenship rights, we are talking about our holistic uh, restorations of our, light, our, our rights as ethnic nationality group, securing justice to the securing political rights as we had before. And that is the gap between the internet knowledge around the international community and Rohingya. And there are more gaps with, with, the, with the Burmese leadership. I think we need to find ways to minimize those gaps. So that's the point, the, the first point. Second, I think uh, um, it is important that we have we, we look into the, this uh, the suffering of Rohingya as genocide and um, and address as it is in a, in a more holistic manner. Yes, ICJ. I think ICJ cannot bring justice for the Rohingya. There should be a, a lot more effort need to be done, and we need criminal accountability immediately. We cannot wait for ten ICJ's decisions for the next, you know, five to ten years or more. Uh, we need to start this happen. We need the criminal accountability for the perpetrators, all perpetrators, not just the military, and. Um, and, and, and we also need to look into, um, you know, the, the, the larger uh, collective loss of the Rohingyas, um, uh, you know, individually and, and again, collectively as a group uh, in Myanmar and beyond, in Bangladesh and elsewhere where our people are, are taking refuge or, or you know, uh, where our people are residing at this point fleeing from persecutions for, for de generations. Um, <clears throat> so well, that include, you know, actually, uh, this is, it is crucial that the, the, uh, we ensure the dignified and voluntary return of refugees, um, uh, to home, to our home in Rakhine state, um, until, unless the military is there, you know, we're not safe to return home, you know, although 
the situations in Bangladesh has deteriorated um, terribly over the past year and people are dying to leave Bangladesh, but it's not safe. You're pu pushing the Rohingya corner uh, to the corner again, and there is no living with Rohingya with no options. And it is utterly irresponsible. I think, you know, there are a lot of uh, good intention for the Rohingya out there. A lot of people want to help and there are states want to help, but I think this can only be done when you, approach it in a more holistic manner and really dig into the core of the problem and talk to the people and try to address the root causes. So yes, repatriation, dignify return is crucial, essential. Otherwise, we're going to lose a uh, generation. And restorations of our equal rights, as you know, my colleagues has already mentioned, uh, equal rights in Myanmar, equal future in Myanmar. Um, Given the Burmese, uh, uh, you know, nature of Bur culture of Burma politics, which is uh, highly ethnocentric, um, it is essential that our future is secure as an ethnic group in Myanmar, and 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 guarantee uh, equal political rights under the federal units or federal states. Um, otherwise, we will be prolonging or even creating other kind of um, uh, conflict or continuations of genocide in Rakhine state. It's actually true to when we, we talk about federal charter and federal union, we haven't been able to define yet. I'm so uh, worried and, and fearful of, you know, we're uh, uh, leading, uh, pushing for so highly ethnocentric uh, federalism where ethnic, uh, the, the, the many states in Myanmar, um, you know, actually um, are, um, composed of many ethnic communities in 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 states or in Rakhine, especially specifically in Rakhine state as well as some other states. Uh, so I think you know yes, we don't want to push for another trap, and there has to be a delicate approach to supporting and building new future uh, as people of Burma as well as international community. And the most important thing is that to secure minority rights within the state to secure equal future and representations within the federal union, whether it is confederations or federal uh, federation. Uh, um, so these are important points. And lastly, you know, um, yeah. Um, lastly, I think, uh, all, as though we talk, we although we talk about justice, um, people are living in really extremely hardship, hard conditions in Rakhine as well as in Bangladesh. I think there is a huge need for the uh, international community to provide a more direct support to the Rohingya community to rebuild our people, our community as a whole. And until unless we ambass uh, and we em empower the community directly um, uh, in, in, a, in a right approach, not just like to tokenize or to create projects, but, but really decentralizing the work as well as um, really putting a given agency to the people and empowering the community is it should be seen as a part of the justice and uh, justice uh, for the Rohingya uh, uh, Rohingya and, and it has to be done in a very victim centered approach. Um, lastly, to wrap up, I think, uh, you know, it is crucial that we see the um, suffering of Rohingya in a bigger picture and, and try to approach as inclusive and as holistic as possible. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for that, Wei Wei. I think drawing on what you've said as well, I mean, Tunkin, I would really like you to reflect on your experience with, you know, spearheading the universal jurisdiction case. So really, I think, changing this narrative of victimhood to agency and, and you know, what your experience has been as well as the process that um, you've, you've um, you know, gone through with the Argentina case. A little bit about that would be, I think, very, very useful for our audience. Can you hear me? Uh, sure, Priya, you know, evidence is very clear that to see 
uh, to see that not only genocidal activities have committed against the Rohingya, but those activities continue today. You know, since last year, we, our organization, we did a briefing on ICJ provisional measures violation, genocide, genocidal activities being, uh, activities being committed against the Rohingya inside Myanmar, as uh, Kunisan, you have mentioned, and uh, Mawi, we mentioned that, you know, uh, arbitrary arrest, torture, restriction, access to education, healthcare. The situation facing Rohingya inside Myanmar is dire. Janta have blocked humanitarian aid, you know, bring off uh, starvation. Faced with this uh, desperate situation, you know, people have forced to flee, arrest by authorities, and dozens of Rohingya were arrested for attempting travel to Rakhine State to Yangon. Also, family believe that universal jurisdiction case we have open in Argentina will complement the ICC investigation uh, because, you know, Myanmar is not a state party to Roma statute. That investigation is relatively limited scope, you know, only covering crimes committed in Bangladesh. Bangladesh says Bangladesh is a state party to the Roma statute. And Argentina case, however, would be able to investigate full range of crimes committed against the Rohingya, including an false appearance, torture, mass murder, rape, other inhumane acts committed against them. For example, like you all know what happened to Tulatuli. We have well documented in Monu village and Chukpin, Ratidong, and uh, Gudaping. So those abuses, those uh, horrific crimes, those will be, you know, very important to bring on this Argentina case. And, uh, you know, we all know that well documented by international media, those crimes uh, would not fall ICC investigation since it took place like inside Myanmar. It does, however, come under there. If you look at Argentina investigation, we move it forward. That will be that important point there. Finally, there is more symbolic significance of universal jurisdiction case in Argentina. It would clearly demonstrate to the Myanmar military leadership that international actors are determined to hold them accountable for decades of violence and oppression they have committed against the Rohingya. It will also bring a sense of hope for the Rohingya, many who see international justice as the best way for them to return home with rights and restoration of their ethnic rights, citizenship rights, and with safety, protection, I believe that is one of the way uh, to move. And one thing in UJ case, what we, we want to point here is, we already in our investigation uh, proposal, what we gave to the court, particularly, as I mentioned earlier, Tulatuli, Chukping, Gudaping, uh, and Shukping, Gudaping, Mongnu village, those are the most horrific crimes since, like Tulatuli, hundreds of people were killed in one day. And Mongnu village also, they slaughtered in one house more than 100 people in two, three days, which is on 27, 28, 29 of August, 2017. And I, we believe that those from there, we can have uh, proper, uh, uh, the court will do proper investigation and with the victims. And then one thing we are having here, double IWM have a lot of evidence. So that will uh, bring more, a stronger way to move forward the case. And here, ICC case, of course, that I mentioned earlier, it wouldn't cover all these things. So one thing 
I, I, I have to repeat it here. When we call about justice, of course, all the rights, of course, to restoring protection and safety. Same time, when our sisters were raped by these military you know, criminals, we want to see them bring to justice. But this ICJ is a kind of, we never know how, the, you know, is is a punishment to the government, right? So this is individual case. We want to bring these criminals to, to the court. That is one of the important points. One thing, what we can see here is international community and the governments, we appreciate their support, including NGOs who are working in the camp. One thing we want to, I, I need to bring this issue is, we Rohingya have capacity to work for our cause. We are here, our brothers and sisters, we are speaking our own issue. We, no matter how Burmese military try to destroy us, we are trying our best to work for our community and to speak ourselves. We have capacity, we are capable, we can do that. And this is an example of how we did the case in Argentina. You know, this is example of how internationally our brothers and sisters are working hard and uh, advocating for their issue. Many years we have seen, and in Bangladesh, our brothers and sisters in camp, they are also highlighting the issue, what they have faced. And they are talking to the medias, they are talking to the governments. One thing is we appreciate governments and NGOs, their support. Some NGOs I'm talking here, they have to, they should not divide the Rohingya diaspora and Rohingya are in a camp. We are brothers and sisters together. We left from the country. All of the, us here, we have our uncle, our auntie, our cousin, our second cousin, everyone have re relatives here. We are a same family here. We are a group here. So do not divide us. Like diaspora Rohingya community, Rohingya refugee community, by that way, if you handle, that will not help. That is you are not working in good faith. If you do that, this is my message. And also do not exploit community by leading with your agenda, a statement or press release or whatever, trying to get Rohingya big teams in the camp. They never know what is going on. So we should discuss with us. We are capable to discuss it. We can advise you. We can advise and we can talk to our brothers and sisters in the camp and do not manipulate and divide each other. Enough. We face under Burmese military many decades of destruction, division and manipulation and, you know, uh, humiliation. We suffered a lot through here. You see, my point here is, of course, we appreciate international community support highlighting the issue and you have to put forefront line rohingya are on the forefront line to work not any other people that can bring more a stronger that can bring more proper way and that can be the reality you are working for the genocide survivors and you are working for this issue, you are promoting Rohingya cults. Not different way with your agenda or with anyone agenda. I mean, some end use, I'm not talking everyone. So as a, this is Rohingya panel, I am very frankly speaking here because we lost everything. We lost our land. We lost our brothers and sisters. We lost all the rights. And please, this is, we are on the brink of totally a community, how Burmese military continuously trying to do. But if you work with us, just be sincere, honest, and strong with the 
with a sincere manner. We are happy to work and we do not want to see that. Of course, I appreciate whoever sincerely supporting us, working with us. We are together on board with them to move forward for the justice and for the rights, restoring rights of the Rohingya. One day, we, you can see us, we are capable and we have capacity. We have our land, our culture. One day we can do that. Our new generation are growing. And I believe that with your support, Sincere, our new generation can move forward and we can see a good future. Thank you. I stop here. Thank you for that, Tunkin. I think I'm going to move a bit from the questions of agency and, and turn to Rone Sandwin, picking up on your comments that you'd mentioned about repatriation and sort of the, um, the representation that the military junta has made in court at the ICJ this week. How do you see the sort of correlation between, you know, voluntary, safe, dignified repatriation linked to these justice processes and justice initiatives? I mean, I think there sometimes is a bit of a disconnect between the two. And I would really like to hear your thoughts more on, you know, uh, the questions around repatriation, resumption of talks also between the Bangladesh military and the junta, and what you see as the next steps and the crucial steps for the Rohingya community. Well, <clears throat> for the repatriation, we need the assistance from the international community. I believe that this court, ICJ or ICC or the Argentina, or even if we have more cases, you know, like in Germany or Sweden or elsewhere, th this will not help for the repatriation because they don't have the law enforcement. And also the ICJ is to determine the, uh, the, the, whether this is the genocide or not. And also they will have somebody that can change the, uh, you know, the discriminatory 1982 citizenship law, reparation, etc. And the, the other case at the Argentina at the International Criminal Court, those are for the individual, you know, or those committed the crime against the Rohingya. And also uh, there have been, you know, uh, some approach from the NUG gov uh, government as well for uh, that to cover all the crime committed since the Rome statute is in place, you know. So all the crime, you know, they have committed, if the, if the ICC accepted this, all the, you know, crime they have committed since 2002 will cover. So, but still, you know, those are not going to directly have the uh, repatriation. For the repatriation, we need the help from the international community. As of now, there are the, uh, as you know, that tripartite the uh, agreement that the China is begging this bilateral agreement between the Myanmar and the uh, uh, Bangladesh and also two UN agency UNDP and the UN uh, uh, uh supporting but these are not enough we want the multilateral agreement and also you know when we talk about the safe uh, you know the dignified and you know sus sustainable repatriation because you know this exodus, the violence against the Rohingya has been uh, cycling, you know, since 1978, it happened in 1991 as well. And again, in 2012, you know, there was a, 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 a state sponsor violence. At the time, uh, the Bangladesh closed the border. That is why, you know, the people took the risky journey to Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, and as well. So in, uh, when we talk about the Rohingya so that we also forget you know, to mention about the 2016. In 2016, 93 Rohingya had to flee to Bangladesh. So there are more than a million, uh, I think around uh, 1.2 million Rohingya are there. So if we want to repatriate them, uh, we all international, you know, the, the, I mean, uh, the, the, most of the country from the West, ASEAN, and you know, the Middle East, whoever, you know, they want to join this, you know, the effort, they, they should join. At least, you know, there should be some superpower country lead, lead this uh, repatriation. And uh, we are not asking for the blue helmet, you know. When we ask about the, uh, you know, uh, international protection, uh, some of them, you know, some people, you know, they misunderstood and, you know, this is not going to happen from the UN peacekeeping force. We are not asking this. We just simply want international pro, uh, protection, those countries supporting the uh, repatriation 
they can bring, you know, that they, they can form a coalition or they can collaborate each other and, you know, they can pressure Myanmar to accept their force present there. Then we can go back, you know, because there is no guarantee that Rohingya will not be persecuted again. And there is no guarantee that Rohingya will be allowed to go back to original villages because they have built the, you know, the so-called transit camp where they will keep the Rohingya for many months and they have planned to build, you know, the like camp-like uh, uh, houses in the 42 area, the remaining area, they will, you know, that there are even the local businessmen are ready to invest you know, they will build the factory, maybe China uh, will invest or the, you know, the Thailand or many other countries. When I think uh, three years ago, when, the, when there is a, you know, the so-called exhibition for the, uh, you know, the investment, at least, you know, the 5 billion from the different country, uh, I mean, even the South Korea included, you know, they pledge for the investment. So they will invest that there. The situation will exactly will be like, you know, the Auschwitz. Of course, you know, the, the infrastructure will be different. Those returnees will have to uh, stay in the designated area. And then, you know, they walk in the, uh, 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 in the factory with the, you know, uh, uh, little, uh, you know, the, with the low wages. You know. this, will, uh, this will happen. So uh, we really need the help from the uh, international community for the disrepatriation. Without their help, you know, it is not going to happen. And even, you know, the Myanmar, as of now, the, the, the military regime, you know, they, they are terrorizing the, the entire community, uh, I mean, entire population in, in Myanmar. And the, this same military is committing the crime against humanity against the entire population in the country. So when they talk about the repatriation, you know, we don't need, even need to think to go back, you know, because they are the real perpetrator. Of course, you know, the, 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 the Austin government collaborated with them. They are also responsible, you know, uh, for, 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 the, for, the, for the crime committed against the Rohingya. But, you know, at least there should be the civilian government, civilian government, at least, you know, they care some sanction and the pressure more than the, this military. You know? So uh, I think uh, 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 I included everything you asked. Uh, if you have more questions, I, I would be happy to answer you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm aware we're a little sort of where the clock is ticking, but I do want to come to Rice as well before we open it up for Q&A. We've got a few questions. Um, so. I think, Rice, I, I would like to ask you, you know, I, I think what really struck me was when you talked about resurrection of fresh wounds from these hearings as well. And I think linking the hearings and the justice and accountability efforts to also what's happening now in terms of challenges imposed by the coup for documentation of human rights violations or protection of the Rohingya community within Myanmar as well. I think we, you know, it would be really good to hear your thoughts on some of those issues as well and, and what you think is the best way forward. I'll be cognizant of time, so I'm going to make it short. I think the advent of the coup and, um, and what has transpired after the coup has added to, to our efforts on documentation of what's, uh, what the regime is actually uh, diehard intent on doing. Uh, we now have uh, many hands to collaborate with, including other ethnic minorities and the majority, which is the Boma population, just like uh, Kune Sanlui just mentioned about how the government is now intent on terrorizing its own population. I mean, needless to say. So it adds to our documentation efforts. Um, there is no change in how the documentation difficulties uh, were there prior to the coup. I mean, my people were not allowed to move from one place to another. Uh, we couldn't get medical treatment. We couldn't get go to schools. And that's still the case. That's still the status quo. So there's no change in that. Those who are languishing in the, in the refugee camps, we still have uh, the human rights, uh, you know, basic fundamental human rights challenges out there. Um, uh, so the, the coup uh, in, in some way or the other has worked in, in um, on sort of a positive side uh, in terms of documentation efforts. However, just like Sister Yasmin mentioned, and she said it very elo eloquently, I'm not gonna repeat that. Uh, it's, this is an opportunity for the NUG 
um, who is behind, of course, the the, uh, the the documentation efforts as well uh, on the other side, for them to collaborate um, holistically uh, with uh, with the Rohingya and the other minorities, not only to utilize this as a catapult to legitimize their their governance. Um, so uh, I'll stop over there, and um, I hope I answered your question. Thank you so much, Rice. I think. We have eight minutes left. Here's what I'd, I'd like to do. Um, we have a few questions. We have about three or four questions. Let me read them out. And panelists, if you, one or you know uh, either of you want to respond to them, that's fine. I'll leave it open to you, except for the targeted question. So the first question is, what action should NUG take now with regards to the ICJ case? Now it's unable to represent Myanmar. Um, the next question is, do you personally believe what the NUG is promising now? What's your expectation after the spring revolution? Meaning, what do you want as transitional justice for the Rohingya? And the third question, and this is targeted directly to Weiwei, is what do you think the role of the ULA, AA for Rohingya repatriation? Some people think NUG should work together with ULA, AA to find a solution. Do you think that's a good option? So. I think maybe we go to Weiwei's question and then the other two questions, you know, the rest of the panel, you can think about it and see if you want to respond or, or react to that question. Thank you so much for the question, Kathy. Um, I think, you know, what I was emphasizing earlier was that we have to um, look into the situations of Rohingya um, in a broader sense and be able to provide protections as a, as a group of genocide survivors. Um, so that is a, I think that's a approach and mindset that we need to have. There may be stakeholders changing all the time. You know, it will be AA or it will be NUG or it will be, N, uh, you know, and something else. Um, you know, stakeholders and power holders, regimes will be changing all the time, right? Uh, what we need is to uh, strat a strategy to be able to provide uh, protection for this group, uh, our people, and to be uh, to have a strategy to sustain that to sustain that protection there. So. I think repatriation is possible with any group unless they meet minimum requirement and conditions on the ground that include a guarantee of non-recurrence and returning to, the, to their places of origin and assuring equal rights in Myanmar. And there is a heavy presence of international community to manage, monitor including Office of the OACHR or any other new body to monitor and to provide safeguard, at least by monitoring the situations. If, that's, if that situation is, if these conditions are met, I think, uh, you know, repatriation with any group is possible. Um, and with, if it's with the military, there should be additional work has to be done. And we don't want to see any perpetrators of the genocide sitting on the uh, at, at the at the government and you know talking to us for repatriation. The military need to be held accountable. And maybe with new military, I don't know, generations of reform um, military institution, the repatriations might be possible. But with the current military. And many of them, those are uh, many of them are responsible for the um, uh, commissions of genocide, direct involvement, and it is I think impossible. But otherwise, overall, I would see you know we can work with any groups or anybody unless they secure these conditions. Thank you. Yasmin, I see your hand is up. Do you want to respond to one of the questions? Thank you. I want to actually reframe that question a little bit. I know that I've already touched on a little bit of the um, list that the NUG can actually follow. Um, what I also want to point this to is not just for us to conceptualize what the NUG can do or what you know the revolution should look like, but also 
what possible uh, what possibility looks like when we actually have a better day when we actually you know move on from this revolution and we get what we want what that would look like we need to actually imagine that now because the value-based society that we're trying to build needs to actually have elements of it now within all of our approach and our work that includes what uh, what was talked about earlier about victim-centered participation um victim-centered you know approach by all of the actors not just the nug and the nug as i've mentioned they need they need to do several things um, one thing is to hold themselves accountable hold themselves to a higher standard and what that looks like um, to the Rohingya community, well, then you need a consultation, an ongoing type of consultation. How would you get that? Well, appoint more people to work with and actually engage with us on a deeper level, not just for, for you to use us as a token, but actually imagine a better day, imagine a society that where Rohingya and, you know, members of the NUG and other ethnic communities can actually coexist peacefully in a federal democracy. Now, I also want to point this, this, this um, action items towards the international um, human rights and humanitarian organizations. What they can also do in order to push the NUG to the right direction, um, obviously not to take away from the NUG's autonomy in any way, shape or form, but the international community can push for uh, Rohingya existence, Rohingya participation in every single room that has anything, any issue, any topics um, discussed pertain to Myanmar needs to have Rohingya participation. Demand where the Rohingyas are. Demand where, you know, who they have engaged with, especially from the donor's perspective. Please make sure that you actually ask your counterparts whether or not they've actually engaged with the Rohingya community or the Rohingya civil society in any way, shape or form. And that's how you actually model behavior, model how uh, Myanmar so civil society and Myanmar um, uh, governance can engage Rohingya meaningfully. Um, and with that, I also wanna close with the, the, the focus um, need to shift to rebuilding. I know we are not at that stage. I know we're just putting out fires right now, but we need to be able to imagine a better possible future. Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin. Tunkin, the floor is yours. Yeah, I'm not taking from this question a lot. If, of course, Maui and uh, Yasmin already mentioned, just a little bit touch on that. One thing, of course, we want to see peaceful coexistence with our sister community, our kind brothers and sisters, where we live together side by side. This is uh, decades of military divide and rule. And of course, we want to see that NUG and ULA, whoever, should work together. But one thing is, one issue going on here is, as this is Rohingya panel, I have to speak up that, there is no such any group recognizing Rohingya identity, existence. We hear in that, oh, this group is not happy with that name and with that thing, you know. My name is Tunkin. My name is that you have to, to be called. This is our ethnic group name. We were recognized as an ethnic group 1962 before military coup power. When NUG look at that, from that part, energy should come up. If they, they want to get rid of military, military, whatever has started since 1962, all you have to ab abolish citizenship law, uh, you know, of course, welcoming a step, energy and others. And also when they take that a step, they have to be brave enough, you know, to accept what the reality happening and same time, of course, we believe on peaceful coexistence. We want to see, uh, we want to live peacefully with side by side with our Rakhine brothers and sisters. But please accept our identity. Please believe that we are exist. People feel that we Ro Rohingya don't exist. Rohingya, there is no such a Ro Rohingya. So, many complication things come that way. So that need to be the bottom line. Of course, the other question I jump in on, 
uh, that NUG already did not uh, um, ICJ case. Um, what action should NUG take now? All we all wanted to see NUG representing ICG. Unfortunately, as a big team, we can't decide it. The court decided it. That is according to the court judges. So now what we can see is we never know. Maybe later on they can join after credential discussion or whatever happened. We never know. Uh, that is not our hand. One thing, NUG have a lot of, you know, during NLD time, and you do know who, uh, some in NUG, some NLD people are there, as you all know. So they can testify, they can support to the Gambia team, you know, by testifying what military did. So that is one way a pressure we can fight our command enemy to fight the military. That will be one of the things NUG will be able to do. I think that is very important. Same time, NUG issues, you know, they have to accept also UN fact-finding mission report. And if they do not accept the reality, how can we move forward? We have seen some positive step, welcoming a step. We are very happy to see that. We want to see more positive a step from them, especially the reality is recognizing the Rohingya genocide, that's accepting UN fact-finding missions report, and abolishing 1982 citizenship law and Rohingya as an ethnic group, Rohingya's existence. That's very important. I stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Tunkin. I think we'll give the last word now to Nesan Ren. Yeah. Thank you, Priya. So I just want to add a few lines. Uh, Tunkin has covered a lot about the NUG. So regardless of you know whether they can represent at the ICJ or not, it doesn't matter when you know the UN uh, a credential committee decide you know whether the NUG is the government of Myanmar or the military regime, then they can represent again there. But meanwhile, they have the people mandate. You know, I don't recognize the military regime as a, a government, and also they are the uh, the the, uh, the main perpetrator. So for me, if I have to recognize a government of Myanmar, I will recognize the NUG. So NUG as a government, you know, uh, they don't, of course, they don't have the, you know, the UN recognition, but at least, you know, they are dealing with the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the government across the world, European government, you know, the even US government and the ASEAN government. So they, they have the power. Of course, they don't have the, you know, the, uh, they don't control the territory, but in the near future, they will control the territory and they have the people mandate. The majority of the people are, in Myanmar are supporting them. They have also international support. As of now, what they should do is, as a government, they can consult with the ASPART lawyer, genocide scholar, if they want, or without even consultation, they know, you know, what happened to Rohingya in the past 45 years since 1978 and you know especially in 2017 in front of their eyes before their eyes because you know the now NUG cabinet member were you know the member of the Austin you know the NLD government they know very well they have the evidence so all they should do is denounce the genocide that will really really help for the the case at the ICJ, the case at the ICC, the case at the Argentina, and also Rohingya will be very happy and they will also gain their international support for, for doing the right thing. That is all I want to say. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, to be honest, I mean, I, I would love for this panel to continue, but I know we've come to the end of, of the allocated time we had. You know, the beginning, we, we were talking about how there are so many issues to talk about. Um, I can only say this. It's been an absolute privilege to facilitate this discussion with this incredible panel. And I would just say that, you know, for anybody who wants a view on all the issues that are facing the Rohingya today, linked to the international justice processes, linked to repatriation, the NUG, the Myanmar coup, 
this should be required watching, quite frankly. And I've learned an incredible amount from all of you today. And, and I, I think I will really be reaching out again to have further discussions and, and to you know, learn more and understand more. And you know, I, I really sincerely hope that this video goes to as many people as possible and they can get a real understanding of the issues and the challenges, but also I think the illumination for the path forward that all of you have presented and that we should really take on board and consider very seriously for next steps in Myanmar. So with that, I would say thank you very much to the entire panel and to all the host organizations and um, wishing everybody a, a good day and you know much learning from this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Priya. Thank you, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much. Thank you, Priya.